You're listening to the Lord's Army Radio Dispatch. The Lord's Army Radio Dispatch is the audio branch of lordsarmy.org, a Christian training ministry. During this weekly podcast, you'll meet individuals on the front lines of battle with the world. You'll meet Christian leaders, pastors, and lay people, all of whom have been used to the glory of God. If you are a Christian, then we encourage you to become an active duty soldier and join the battle that's going on around you every single day. Come join the Lord's Army. Thank you for listening to the Lord's Army Radio Dispatch. I'm Skip Wilson. I wanted to spend today to talk about the Lord's Army Outpost Program. It's something new that's coming to the the site. If you've been to the website, you've noticed that there's a whole new look. Um, I mean, a lot of it's still the same, but I mean, new videos, new graphics, a lot of new wording, and there's a whole new section called Lord's Army Outposts. I want to talk to you about why that is, why we did that, and what that is. And we're going to do that just today. I know that for the we've kind of been building up to it, sort of been seeding out topic by topic for the past few podcasts, talking about how you can change your life, how you can change the world, uh, the importance of um, of opening your home, those types of things. And so it's been sort of topical up leading up to this point. And then today we're just going to straight up talk about the Lord's Army Outpost program. And then next week we will resume back with our uh, normal format of interviewing Christians on the front lines of battle with the world. And so this will be sort of the last, um, and not, not last forever, but at least the last in this series of the extemporaneous type format. So, I don't know if you view that as a good thing or a bad thing, but this is the <laughs> the final one of those. So, let's just talk very simply why we did the Lord's Army Outpost, or why we felt that we should do the Lord's Army Outpost. Um, the main reason is because you are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the primary goal of your life as a new believer. Um... And if just some scripture behind that, remember the two great commandments. Uh, You know, this is in uh, these two great commandments. They're in Matthew 22. They're Mark 12. They're in Luke 10. Um, The two great commandments, of course, are to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, if you're not doing what he's told you to do, what he's commanded you to do. And, of course, uh, in the Great Commission, uh, our Lord, our God, uh, commands us to go into all the world and make disciples. And so that is what we are, and that is what we are to do. Likewise, if you don't love others enough to share the gospel with them, then you're not really showing love to them at all. What does a lost person need? What does somebody outside of Christ need? the most? And the answer is they need Christ. They need the gospel. All other things are secondary to that. If if someone is an alcoholic, do they need to solve that problem? Absolutely. And, if, and there's a good work in helping them with that. But what's their ultimate need? Their ultimate need is the gospel of Christ. You know, if someone is, you know, whatever, if they're just a generally unhappy person, well, what is the joy of life? Well, the joy of life, what is the answer to uh, anxiety is this Jesus Christ in Matthew 6. He said, says, you know, consider the lilies, they neither, neither toil nor spin, yet even Solomon in all his glory was not raised, was raised such as these. Um, the answer to all of life's earthly problems is Christ, but then also, of course, the big one is that we are made to glorify God in eternity as either an example of his wrath and justice or as an example of his love and mercy. And so we are to preach the gospel, to do all things possible, um, when, uh, to do as much as we can to impact as many people as we can, uh, because we, we care about people. If we love others, we want them to glorify God, uh, ideally, as examples of his love and mercy. So our Lord clearly calls us to be disciple-makers in Matthew 28. Uh, we're to teach others about him. And then, of course, you know, even think about just, um, you know, the, there's an often quoted verse, and if you if you go to church, hopefully you've heard this verse, 
um, several times. It's a very important verse, uh, or passage, two verses, but uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, I'm reading from the NASB. It says, all scripture is God-breathed, theonustos, all, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, we use that verse to talk about the importance of Scripture and the supremacy of Scripture, which is good. That's what that verse is about. <clears throat> but do you ever notice what else is in there? Um, did you catch it in regards to discipleship? Um, we are given, it says that Scripture is God-breathed, all right? So God has given us Scripture fully fully a work of God, a divine work in the Bible. Um, also a work of man. He, wor he, he worked through men, the Holy Spirit. The, you know, the men wrote as they were carried along by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit worked through men. So it's a divine book written by the third person of the Trinity. And yet it is a, also a book written by men. And, uh, or a series of books, collections of books. Um, that's the first part of this. All scripture is God breathed. And what is it useful for? Well, it's useful for teaching others. For teaching. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for correcting. And it's useful for training. Notice that those are all things. Um, now, clearly in this verse, I think he's talking about that it trains you and that it rebukes you as you sort of do your own personal study. But also, clearly, the implication is there that the reason why you're being trained up and rebuked and, and made all these things by Scripture, what does the rest of the verse say? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So why is it important to be trained? Why is it important to be taught? Why is it important to be rebuked by Scripture? Why are those things important? Well, it's important so that you can go out there and do good works. And so, so that you can go out there and be the word in the world. Um, that's the whole point of Scripture. And so, you know, we're not given the Bible so, just so that ourselves can increase in knowledge. But rather, God has given us the Bible so that we can be equipped and trained for doing good works. We are to be trained up so that we can go out and train others. Failure to make disciples uh, is at the core of the problems facing society today, uh, not just the church. Um, when the church grows silent, the world becomes a very cold and a very dark place. Um, I was reading a, a book. Um, it was by an atheist apologist. And um, anyway, he was talking about how when the church was in charge, uh, I mean, you know, it was known as the Dark Ages. And one of the things uh, that I appreciate about that book is the observation that, yeah, it, it is just a fact that when the Roman Catholic system, when, when the church and politics were in line, and even a way that modern Catholics would denounce um, most, the, it is known as the Dark Ages. You know, when you had people who were being burned uh, for trying to read the scriptures in their own language, that's known as the Dark Ages. And so while the point that this atheist was trying to make was that when the church was in charge, the world was a cold and dark and horrible place, it actually made the opposite point in my mind because <laughs> what the time period he was referring to was a time when your average person would have had no access to scripture. And so when the... Uh, when the Bible was being kept away from the masses when people were being discouraged from study and thought and those types of things. That is the Dark Ages. And that's, those are all very anti-Christian ideals. Um, we believe in the perspicuity of Scripture, the, the belief for the average person to understand it because of the Holy Spirit and dwell. We believe that the Bible is um, God's Word and it is useful. Uh, for teaching and for reproof and for those things. And so when those th when uh, the Re Reformation happened and the Bible became ubiquitous amongst homes and you had people encouraged to study it and learn it for themselves, guess what also happened? The Renaissance. 
you had the rise in science, and that's because of the scientific method uh, being developed. Uh, you had the scientific method being developed by Francis Bacon, the Puritan, Francis Bacon. Uh, you had, uh, those are all things. That's one of the reasons why I cringe anytime I hear a Christian say um, something anti-science. Um, because science is very much us. Science is our thing. Science is the thing of the Christians. That's a very, very modern thing for Christianity to be separated from science. Um, and, of course, that lends itself to the what's called equivocation error, because a lot of times what people mean when they say science versus Christianity is evolution versus Christianity, but evolution is unscientific. Um, it is uh, the opposite of scientific. And so, anyway, just don't ever commit that error. <laughs> but, uh, please, at least not while I'm around, um, because that drives me absolutely insane. Um, to equate evolution to science is to have lost the battle already. Um, science is ours. Science is the Christians. Um, not. Uh, you know, we're the ones that encourage, first encourage thought, first encourage knowledge, uh, you know, um, and we're the, also the ones that have the right answer, so we're able to do science in an even better way. Anyway, sorry, side note, rant. Um, but when, when scripture is taken out of a society, is when it becomes a cold, dark place. And when scripture is in a society, is uh, when you get amazing leaps forward, such as the time of the founding of our nation, which was occurred right around the time of the Great Awakening. Uh, you have the Industrial Revolution, which occurred right around the time of the Second Great Awakening. Um, you have uh, the Renaissance, which occurred, occurred during the Reformation. Um, you'll notice that when you have a resurgence of the church, you also have a resurgence um, or a great leap forward in, uh, in technology and in life in general as well. Um, the worst of those was the, the Second Great Awakening. <laughs> it was a lot of bad scripture. And I also think the worst of those revolutions was the Industrial Revolution. So <laughs> sort of go, go hand in hand. I think you have proof causation there. But just interesting. Um, I, we wrote about this uh, in a previous post uh, on our blog called The Dumb Church, um, but one of the responses, one of the massive failures of the church um, at large, uh, especially in the 90s, was to make church very appealing and dumbed down to the world. And so... Uh, in a very real way, the Christians respond. The, the church's response to the crisis of uh, the church being removed from society was a dumbing down of the messages and making church more enjoyable for the unsaved. And again, we write about that in the, in the post called "The Dumb Church," but um, you can get on lordsarmy.org forward slash blog. Scroll down; it's one of the first ones we did. But <coughs> anyway. That was, uh, of course, the opposite response. You know, Christianity is not anti-intellectual. Um, when we begin to make Christianity anti-intellectual, is the detriment of the church. It hurts the church. The church, you know, the church buildings, um, the actual church services are for the saved. They're not for the unsaved. Does that mean I'm against altar calls and, and gospel messages and sermons? No. Side note, but. All right, so here's the, here's the great news for us living today. It's really good news. Really, really good news. When you look at the actual facts and statistics, while you see a lot, a lot of alarmist things, um, it's true. Uh, you know, here's just some facts. It is true that studies have repeatedly demonstrated that fewer young people are identified as Christians. When you get under 30, only one in three even identify in Christ, as Christian which is a complete flip-flop of over 30, so, um, where it's two out of three. So you only have one out of three identifying as Christian and all, and even that group contains some groups that um, are overtly not Christian, uh, such as Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and, uh, and then, of course, the fringe of Christianity, uh, such as like Episcopalian and, and Roman Catholics. Um, sorry, guys, if you're listening, but you're on the fringe of Orthodoxy. Anyway... That is uh, that is true. 
Okay, so it's just true that only a third of young people are identifying as Christian in this country, which is the lowest ever. So you get a lot of alarmist statistics. However, in a massive study of the unchurched by LifeWay Research, most of those that individuals that do not have, uh, that do not go to church or are unchurched, most of those individuals have a positive view of Christianity. Uh, nearly 80 some percent say that Christianity is good for society. And more than 50%, 51% actually said that they would like to learn more about Christianity. And so you hear these alarmist statistics. You hear these things saying, you know, oh, our young people are, are leaving the church. That's not so much true for the young people today. The young people today, mo uh, many of them have never even been to church, they have no idea what the message is. They have no idea what the gospel is. Um, and they're not going to go to church. Why would they go to church? There's no reason to. Nobody's inviting them to. And I don't even think we should invite them to church. I think we should give them the message. And that's the Lord's army outpost approach. Because remember, the church is for saved. And so, um, well, it's not bad to invite somebody to church, I don't think, um, if you're bringing them so that your pastor can do your evangelism for you. That's just sort of uh, outsourcing your own ministry, right? God saved you. You have the you have the ministry, and so don't outsource your evangelism or your discipleship uh, obligations. Uh, you are to go into all the world and make disciples, and that's what the Lord's Army Outpost is all about. But um, I'll get to that in a second. But it is just it is true that yes, um, while the stats are alarming in terms of the number of people that are professing Christians, the reality is, is that most people view Christianity as an overall good. I think only 6% of those surveyed said that they view Christianity as a negative in society. So, and you know, I found that when I've gone up to, um, when I've witnessed to strangers, when I've gone up and given the gospel to people, when I've talked to people, the vast majority of people are incredibly friendly. You know, you, there's a, I can't really describe the fear that builds up when you're going out, even if you're just handing out gospel tracts, so you're not even saying anything, you're just handing them out. Um, the fear that builds up when you're doing that type of thing is palpable, at least it is for me, which is sort of silly because, you know, the vast majority of people you're talking to, even if they don't believe what you're saying, appreciate what you're saying and are thankful for what you're saying and want you to keep doing what you're doing. And so, um, anyway, don't, don't fear those who are not Christians. Um, at all, because they likely have a positive view of your beliefs, um, even though they don't really know what Christianity is all about. Um, <laughs> but that's what we got to teach. That's where the discipleship comes in, right? We have to teach them that. And so it just means that our Lord's words uh, were just as true, um, are just as true in his day, uh, or excuse me, are just as true in our day as they were in his day. Um, in Matthew 9, 37, uh, this is from the NASB again, uh, our Lord said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest, is plent the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Why is it that only one out of three young people are Christians, and yet the vast majority of them are interested in or, or, excuse me, the vast majority of them have a favorable view, and over half of them are actually interested in Christianity. People aren't working with these guys. People aren't working with young people. The older generation is not evangelizing the younger generation, by and large. And study after study shows that. To me, those are the alarmist statistics. Don't just complain about a shrinking Christian influence in society. Why is it shrinking? It's shrinking because you're not doing anything about it. You, me. The whole reason we started the Lord's Army as a whole ministry was to motivate people. We wanted to, to do a podcast that highlights people doing good work. We wanted to do a blog that talks about how you can do work and to give you a tool to equip it, uh, to equip you to do good things. <coughs> we, we wanted to, we launched with online trainings to get people to, to understand the core basic truths of Christianity. We launched a book that really is both a discipleship and an evangelism tool. And then now, we're taking a step even further, and I think this is uh, 
this is by far the thing I think I've been most excited about with this ministry, the Lord's Army Outposts. So the Lord's Army Outposts are essentially book study groups that are led by individuals that uh, we've identified and sort of talked to and vetted and for theological soundness. And uh, although you certainly don't have to be a scholar, I mean, every Christian is called to, to have a discipleship ministry. And so we, uh, we sort of have just talked to these people and worked with these people. And you can be one too. But we have identified individuals to start in home, or at least it, it, at least small. It doesn't necessarily be in home. I, I, I know at least a couple of them. You know, you can go to coffee shops. Uh, you know, wherever wherever you can find a nice quiet place to sit down with about ten people and go through a book study with them. That's the whole idea with the Lord's Army Outpost. That's that's the thing. It's a the means of evangelism. If you were going into a country that knew nothing about Christ. What you would do is do a prayer walk, right? You would do a prayer walk, and you would be praying that God sends you the right people, and you'd be walking around, and you would identify some people to bring into a study. And then you would pour absolutely everything into those people. And then you would equip them to do what you did, and to go out and start their own studies. This is what our Lord did when he pulled in the 12, uh, the 12 apostles poured everything into them, and then sent them out. And then they went out, uh, 11 of them, one of them replaced by Paul. Matthias, I don't think, was ever an apostle, but we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> that's um, J. Vernon McGee actually has a commentary on that, about Matthias. But anyway, so whatever. The 12 apostles, which there only have ever been 12, uh, just replaced by Paul, but um, they go out into all the world, and then they do that same thing. And so you have 12 that then become, uh, you know, of course, on the day of Pentecost, you have 3,000. And then, you know, you, so you have some of these massive events, massive things. But a lot of times it's just them going up into a house uh, or going up into a synagogue, preaching the, preaching the word. Half the people in the synagogue want to kill them. Half the people in the synagogue repent. And those half that repent, they create a small group. They pour everything into those people. And then they teach those people how to go out and teach others. And so <clears throat> the reason why the church was able to survive persecution was because it had this sort of house model or this private meeting model. Um, very hard to track down. Very hard to eliminate. This is the Lord's Army Outpost model. It's, it's the biblical model for evangelism. While you do have um, you know, Paul in the marketplace preaching the gospel to people as they're shopping, and then eventually being pulled up onto the Areopagus, you, the vast majority of what you see in Scripture is um, more one-on-one -on -one discipleship. You know, uh, you know, Peter sitting down with the eunuch. Uh, uh, you, you know, them hanging out in Lydia's house. Uh, the vast disciple, you know, uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, sitting down with Apollos. Um, you have uh, you have more one on one sort of discipleship, and that's the exact model that we would use in the mission field today. And I think one of the things that we're not realizing as a church is that we're not in uh, is that we are in a mission field now. We are not in a church society. You know, when you're when you are evangelizing to people that have spent their whole lives in church and then rejected it in college, you use a different approach than what we have today, where you have people, the majority of the people out there, know nothing. Know nothing about Christianity. You can't go out there and just say, hey, you need to repent. They don't even know what you're talking about. So it just takes a little more time, a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, much harder to do street evangelism. That's the Lord's Army Outpost. And if you're interested in finding an outpost, or if you're interested in starting an outpost, uh, go to lordsarmy.org forward slash outposts. This concludes this particular dispatch from the front lines of the Lord's Army. If you want more information or content, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube.
apply what you have learned in this episode. Remember, you do not become a great man or woman in Christ without taking action. One easy way you can help spread the gospel right now is by subscribing to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, just by liking us and leaving us a review, you can have a massive impact in how many people we reach. Go out there, take action, join the battle, lordsarmy.org.